Tales of the Puka are many. And for each of those tales, there is yet another version to follow each one. But this is the story as I heard it. Now, John Tasselberg was an enormous man. It is said by many of his friends and neighbors that he was born an enormous man and he never shrank an inch during all of his life. John Tasselberg was a smith and the exercise that he got at the forge, lifting great weights of metal, pumping the bellows, hammering at the anvil, made his arms three, four, ten times the size of that of any of his neighbors. John Tasselber was a relatively easy-going man, a man who was friendly and liked a bit of fun. You can ask the miller. <laughs> now, his lady, his intended, was Janet Scaly. Janet Scaly was a sharp woman. She had some patience, as you might imagine, to put up with Tasselberg and his mischief. But not always too much. On one particular night, Tasselberg knew that he was expected the very next morning for breakfast at Janet's father's table. And so he was not to stay out too late. He worked in the forge. For to marry a woman, it was a good idea to see that he might impress his father with the gains from his work. So one project more yet to finish as he labored into the night. The gate was locked, the gate to the yard, so that no others might come in to interrupt him, bring him more work, bring him more work, to keep him there in the forge longer than was necessary. But... As at one point, he made his way to the barrel next to the door, which served the dual purpose of catching that which fell when he emptied his bladder and quenching the iron work. He heard a noise through the door that sounded like horse's hooves. He wasn't even working on shoes for a horse. He was working on a chandelier, a fine decorative piece, for the Lord's Manor. And no one should have come through that locked door. Carefully, he put down the hot metal and opened the door to peek out. Sure enough, what was there in the waning moonlight but a large black steed, a fine shiny coat, a long tail and mane, combed so straight as ever you please. An excellent specimen of animal. And Tasselber, being a smith, was a fine judge of horse flesh at that. But it had no business in his yard, and he had an inkling. So he took a blanket from a hook, threw it casually over one shoulder, and burst open the door. Oh, what is this? Why? One of my friends must have snuck their horse into the yard when I wasn't looking. Ho, ho, good fellow, how are you? And he walked over to the horse and stroked its mane and got a look in its eye, red from the edge to the core. Now the kooka, for those few of you who are unwise enough not yet to know, is a fairy, a devil of sorts. The Norse have their stories. The Irish people with great joy adopted the puka into their own stories and legends. One of the fae, they would say. But common to most of those stories is the puka's ability to change shape. A chicken, a goat, a man. Very often, a horse. And that horse liked to find drunk men out in the night. 
take them upon their back or spring up between their legs. <laughs> All unannounced and take them for a wild ride through the night, running them through, licket, through thickets or, or the lake marshes, running them through weather and into obstacles, battering and bruising them all the night, there to dump them, if a man is lucky, really by the side of the road, or outside someone's home, spellbound. With their magic, the pukas keep the riders on their back, unable to dismount until the buka is ready to let them go. John knew this. And he knew what he was doing as he set that first hand upon the mane of a horse. Sure enough, the puka's magic lifted him lickety-split up onto its back. Surprising speed for so large a man, and he had to put no effort into it. Then the puka began to canter straight at the gate. Across the yard it ran until its steps took it out into the air and out into the night. But to the puka's surprise, a noise began behind its ears. <laughs> its rider was laughing. Tasselbur was bored at the forge. And now he had a fine adventure ahead of him. He pulled a skin from his belt and took a hefty swig, carefully tucking the skin back under his belt so that it would not be dislodged. And he laughed Why he took that blanket from his shoulder, whipped it round the horse's neck, and suddenly, who was the rider and who was ridden? Who was in control of this wild ride? as the puka began to try to run out towards the lake. John Tasselbur heaved mightily with a blanket, pulling its head back over to the right. And they began to gallivant through the night, the puka straining with every, with every pace to take the rider where he would. And Tasselbur pulling with all his mortal might against the wishes of the puka. Sometimes one would gain its head, sometimes the other dragged him back, and sparks began to fly from the puka's hose, even on the airy substance of the night itself. So, Tasselberg, who had often lost a bet with his friend the miller, decided that the miller's house was the way to go, and he ran the puka across the thatched roof, setting it afire. <laughs> that would be a great joke on him in the morning. But all this commotion did not go unnoticed. Many of the neighbors looked out and saw a huge, hairy beast of a demon riding a coal black steed through the night, and they pulled shut the windows, the shutters of their houses. But one woman thought she recognized that particular devil's laughter and looked out. John! Tasselbar! Get you down here right now! Quit your fooling around! You have to bed early for breakfast in the morning! <laughs> he never heard a word so far down the sheet. So, Scaly took herself and ran out the door, up to the church, where she knocked ever so loudly on the priest's door, until he, hearing all the commotion, the wailing in the night, the clatter of the horse's hooves on empty air, the maniacal laughter of Tasselberg, the pounding on his door, finally came to see what was the matter. And as he opened the door, escape, he never got out the second syllable of that woman's name. So quickly was she through the door. Pushing him aside, she ran up the steps. Up she climbed the ladder into the steeple. Tasselbar! Get you over here right now! This time he heard her, and he knew that voice. So he pulled mightily on the blanket that he had 
improvised as a noose, I mean bridle, for the demon. <laughs> and guided it over towards the steeple. And as he rode past, ever so quickly, she said, Tassifer, get down from that horse right now! Get you to bed! He'd ridden fast so quickly. He heard her call, he yanked again, and kicked as hard as ever he could, nearly staving in the demon's ribs. Pulled back by the steeple again. <laughs> but, Scaly, I'm stuck! I can't get off! <laughs> she wasn't sure whether to believe his words or the laughter. <laughs> so being a wise woman, she pulled from her pouch a slender needle of the purest silver, a gift from her grandmother. And as John and the Puka rode by one more time, she took that pure and precious metal in her hand, held on to the rope from the bell, and leaned out as it began to ring. She stabbed the puka with the silver as hard as ever she could in its rump. And then it reared up. It turned nine to upside down and finally let go its rider. And as Tasselberg tumbled down, down, down to the ground and landed with the mightiest thump you might ever imagine, she looked down and said, Tasselbear, I told you to get to bed. So don't you expect any breakfast in the morning? <laughs>